You're listening to Tara Lynn's A Geek Saga Podcast. This episode features audio from a discussion panel that was recorded at DragonCon 2019. It is four o'clock, so we are going to start this uh, Fire and Blood panel all about Targaryen history. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, Roll quick some housekeeping stuff. Uh, We do have room volunteers with mics for if you have questions. So please, you know, please raise your hand and they will bring you a mic. It's just easier for everybody to hear you as long as both the mics are working, which doesn't always happen. (laughs) Um, So... um, also, just don't forget, and I'll try to remind everybody of this again at the end of the panel, to uh, rate the panels in the apps, particularly for this track. This is really important because, as you can see, this room is packed. And it's been this way, like, basically every panel I've been um, on in here this weekend. So, yeah, uh, rate the panel and make note that uh, the high fantasy track needs a bigger room. Don't know if it'll happen, but the more people who poke Dragon Con about it, the more likely it is to happen. So, uh, I'm going to introduce myself. The panelists are going to introduce that themselves. We'll kind of get the, the you know, talk started, but again, we really do want to hear from you guys, so just raise your hand if you have a comment or a question. Um, my name is Tara. I am at a Geek Saga on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. I am a webcaster, podcaster, uh, blogger, author. Uh, I wear many hats, but the biggest one <laughs> and most important one for high fantasy stuff is I run Ice and Fire Con, which is the first ever Song of Ice and Fire Game of Thrones convention in the States. And uh, you want to start down there, Dan? Hey, I'm Van Allen Plexico. I'm the author of 18 novels, some science fiction, some fantasy superhero, and things like that, including Lucian Dark God's Homecoming, which seemed kind of appropriate for this panel. And I'm um, a professor at Southwestern Illinois College, and I am the host of the White Rocket Podcast, where we really have devoted big chunks of our time last few years to talking about uh, a Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones. We've done quite a few episodes covering. In fact, my co-host, when the last season started, said, we'll just go, we'll just leave the mics on 24-7 and just keep talking about it every day until, <laughs> until it's over. So. Um, I'm Ashley. I'm a founding member of a podcast of Ice and Fire. We have been podcasting for over 12 years now. Uh, we are the longest-running podcast dedicated to the show. Uh, in 2013, we won the Geeky Award for Best Podcast, and we're just we're still going strong. Hi, my name's Chloe. I'm a co-host of the podcast Girls Gone Canon. Oh, I'm sorry, Elena. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elena. I'm from House Mormont. <laughs> we will be discussing other skips in the line of succession. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see you over Tara's big thing. <laughs> well, uh, my name's Elena. I am also from Ice and Firecon. I am a member of the Small Council. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at the Bear Air. Uh, I'm a big, huge Daisy Mormont fan, so if you need to talk about Mormont feelings, I got you. It's fine. <laughs> she's the Bear fan. Like now someone can go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did you say something? You have to speak up. I can't hear from down there. Hi, my name is Brian. <laughs> <laughs> um, my biggest thing would be I uh, wrote and directed a two-hour a uh, parody musical of uh, Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones matched with Hamilton music called Westeros, an American musical. It's been performed at Ice and Fire Con for several years and is on YouTube in its entirety now. I guess that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go here. Um, uh, I'm a co-host of Girls Gone Canon. We do a Song of Ice and Fire point of view chapter by point of view chapter. We are on our 66th episode right now, so that's exciting. Uh, we're covering his dark materials as well. And uh, I'm the kind of person that wore a northern shirt to a Targaryen panel, I guess. So, to know. To know. <laughs> all right. So, uh, as we all know, Fire and Blood came out not quite a year ago. It is a, the first half of, I, I believe it's a two-part. It's going to be two parts, mm-hmm. not just not three, just two. Mm-hmm. So, it's the first half of the Targaryen history. A lot of it is... Um, A little, there's a good portion of it that's rehashed from previous novellas and from World of Ice and Fire, but some things were changed. A lot of stuff was fleshed out, and we're going to talk a lot about those changes, I think. Someone someone made notes about them, I know. (laughs) Um, But for me, uh, I kind of, I just like anytime we get new text, and this was a tome. Uh, And I, I was unsure how I was going to feel about it. I like the world of ice and fire for what it is, but it is dry in terms of like reading. Um, so I, it was really neat to get a different, uh, 
perspective sort of with the way Fire and Blood was written and, and to get insight into characters that I kind of always knew I liked, like Jaharis and Alzan, particularly Alzan, and characters I didn't really know any about, like Black Alley. Um, you know, meet these new characters in this world that, you know, we've all grown to love. Um, so I don't know, what do you guys think? Uh, biggest likes or dislikes about Fire and Blood? Uh, the thing I liked about it the most, really, I think, is that it's put together like a Dan Jones history book. I mean, I mean, sure, it would be nice to have a narrative, but if George had tried to put all of that into a into the same form as the other books, we'd have another nine or ten volumes, you know. So, I liked it. It just was it just skimmed right along. I mean, I know that it, I know that's off putting to some people because it doesn't read like a novel. It's not a novel. It's, it really is like a history text or something. But, but it but yet it's able to spend more time on the more interesting parts. It's, it's able to put more emphasis on the characters. And one thing I think is neat is he's able to say, well, this, this source said this about so-and-so, but then this source said that, and so believe whichever one you want. So it, it's not even definitive in itself, which is the way history actually works. So I, I, I think I focused more on just the construction of it as a historian myself and how it's put together. The content, obviously, we'll talk about. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I of course just love getting more content, but I, I love the the world build, building of you know worlds within worlds, and like getting the the cautionary tale for young girls, but then also getting the story that that actually came from and how it was built over and over through uh, retellings and how it changes. Um, I, I just love all that so much, and I think my least favorite part was getting to the end and realizing that was only half the book. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, it doesn't say all 300 years before right. us. <laughs> yes. 300 years. Well, and, and following up on the uh, having different narrations and different sources and having one of them essentially be the church and one of them be the state and then one of them be just the biggest troll jester in the seven kingdoms. <laughs> the MVP um, it, of the seven kingdoms. The, the different perspectives were huge. And, and by the end, uh, I don't know if this was true for everyone, but when it started going, oh, well, Septon Barth says this, and, and so-and-so said this, and mush I just skipped right to the mushroom part. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to watch it with everything. <laughs> I think the truth is somewhere, like, between mushroom and Septon Barth, like, in between. Like, you take, like, I'll take 10% of this, 10% of this, we'll call it a day. <laughs> uh, one thing I really enjoyed is, obviously, the flush more flushing out of the Dance of the Dragons. Uh, oh, Sorry. Uh, one thing I really enjoyed was uh, the more flushing out of the Dance of Dragons. Um, I mean, that was obviously there's a lot of history there. Is it went into a lot more detail for the houses, how they broke up in between the two, and then also I really enjoyed learning about the other uh, dragon riders during the Dance with Dragons. Um, one thing I was really upset about was the fact, well, we got to the end and it's like Aegon the Third sits upon his throne for the first time by himself, and then it just done i'm like what just happened why is this like this i was i was i guess i was a little disappointed you since you mentioned the dance of dragons i was a little disappointed that we didn't get more on nettles and uh yes. sheep sailor like i was really hoping that we would finally find out what happened and i think there's like that that bit um where oh. they mentioned that she might be in the, the oh, she's she's in the, the right 100 percent tinfoil yeah. but it's true uh she's in the veil <laughs> She settled in the mountains. There are rumors that one of the mountain clans there had found itself a new queen and with a dragon mount. And until then, there are no mentions of one of the mountain clans that Tyrion recruits, which are called the Burned Men. A little bit tinfoil But yeah, there, I mean, there, there are hints that, she ended up, that that's where she ends up, but I, I would have liked a, lo a little bit more solid ending for Nettles and Sheep Stealer. I don't know why I got so attached to that particular storyline in the Dance of Dragon. Yeah, there's a lot of that stuff too that like you get through it in this book and you're like, but I wanted more of that, not more of Damon Targaryen bad boy on his motorcycle with his leather jacket. <laughs> well, and, and, and on the subject of Nettles, I, I think it's interesting that even among the three perspectives, they all kind of go with the uh, idea that her and Aemon, you know, potentially her lovers there's not a ton of discussion about whether she may be his daughter but yeah um all of his actions make sense either way yeah uh i think i lo i loved definitely loved getting through the dance of the dragons and having all of this enrichment added to it and i think after we've seen the season uh, the series finale it's obvious why fire and blood was released it was kind of to preface and cushion a little bit because I think there were some ideas that the show just wasn't ever going to get to or we weren't going to understand through that retelling. 
Um, and Fire and Blood is definitely, George said in an interview, you know, Danny should really read this book. It would be good for her to learn about her ancestors so she doesn't make those mistakes. And I think uh, we see a lot of that Cersei and Daenerys kind of stuff going on in the Dance of the Dragons, in that enrichment. But just, I would say disappointment wise, Creek and Stark was disappointing. I expected something better and it was all right. It was just, okay, this is it. This is, this is the hour of the wolf. I was disappointed. I said what I said. <laughs> and, 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 and I think part of Creek and Stark, I think he, he was meant as a salve for Ned Stark mm -hmm. fans more than anything. Like, you know what? If, 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 if a Stark comes down from Winterfell to be the hand of the king and he brings an army with him, um, he's able to enact northern justice in swift fashion and get things done. And I, I think for a lot of people it was just, I don't know, it resonated with me in just a, oh, okay, this 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 is how Ned should have done it. Yeah, I see a lot of uh, parallel to the show with John yeah. going south. I think that, too, is uh, definitely begs to say there might be something where John does take the armies down south in the books from it. Um, and again, you guys, if you have comments or questions, just raise your hand and, and the gentleman with the Michael microphone, I think it's just one, might, will we'll help you out. Um, otherwise, we'll just talk at you for an hour. I don't think that's very fun. Um, oh, we got a question? Yeah, all right, all right. Can you hear me Yeah, sorry. Okay. All right, all right. so I, of course, I adored this book, and I always said to people, before we ever watch season eight, we should all read Fire and Blood, mm -hmm. all of us. And then I think a season eight would have made a little bit more sense. But anyway, I want to get your take on the yellow, old yellow toad theme mm. and, oh. uh, mm. and the Battle of Dorne and Aegon coming down for that because that went on for like three years and I've loved him yeah. since the first you know season on that alone. I would be a happy woman. But um, I just wanted to get your sense of your take of that, you know, because they you know they go into the exploration of him coming down from Valyria, yep. the Valyrians going one way, Targaryens going another, and then of course he comes out and says, you know what, taking over the rest of the kingdom, and he gets to Dorne, and Dorne is like, mm, ah, ah, ah. Mm -hmm. and, and so really um, I just wanted to kind of get your perspective on that whole battle of the Yellow Toad, because I think she was just masterful in handling Aegon Targaryen, and he really, really never did technically defeat her. No, no, no so sure didn't, I'm not at all. Dorne in present, Song and Ice of Fire could have been just, you know, da Daenerys after Westeros. I think she would have really had a hard time defeating Dorne if she could have done it at all. Yeah. So, yeah. Especially after that little mishap in yeah. Marine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and and that's, a, that's a great question. I, I also love that part. Um, I think we were talking about this a couple days ago when we were prepping. Um, the idea that they basically conquer six kingdoms and just cannot find an army to beat in Dorne because the Dornish, uh, ar the Dornish forces just enact this guerrilla warfare, uh, just abandoned cities, scorched earth, uh, the poisoning the wells, and just, you know what, we can't beat you. There aren't enough of us and you have dragons, but our land can. <laughs> Dorne itself will beat you. Um, yeah, it's basically Russia. It's, yeah. 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 <laughs> in, in, in this context, it is, no, you're not going to be able to stop the German war machine, yeah. but the German war machine can't stay out here. Yeah. They don't have supply lines. You can come and take our, these hold fast because none of the Dornish forces are there. They're all hiding. And uh, like, like you said, the yellow toe, she's literally sitting there in her palace, and Rainey's comes up and says, surrender. And it's like... No. Why? <laughs> I, I'm good. It's like, it, it I'm goes 90 like, years old and blind. You can kill me. It's not going to be a good look. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point of having castles if there's nobody in it? Right. Yes, exactly. And, and, and this, so they put in very basic garrisons and leave. And then all of a sudden, all the Dornish forces, I think they say, as if come up from, coming up from the sand, from the stone, from the mountains, uh, all the garrisons are taken back. All these marcher lords and stormlanders and, and reach kings are, or sorry, reach lords are... Is demolished and it, it really shows the difference of the culture of the people because like in the, the rest of westeros it's like oh i have a new lord now whatever we follow this lord now and we follow that lord whoever's taken over that's your small folk just follow whoever they're told to follow whereas dorn's like no we're dornish mm -hmm. yeah and, and I, I was gonna say i just wanted to mention that is a uh, pretty big parallel between the dorn and or between dorn and the north um the uh, the parallel between Dorne and the North is uh, very prevalent with that because 
obviously like the north uh, the north remembers and the Dorn and Dorn especially with this situation even if somebody was invading they're like nah we're gonna keep following Martell's it's fine bye so also yeah I apologize you guys some of these microphones you literally have to like breathe on them to talk so yeah just let us know if you really are having trouble hearing us I apologize um, <laughs> uh, yeah no I, I well and also I mean like the the perils between the north and, and Dorn the the really important thing I think is the people like Ashley said but also the fact that they both have um, like land like mountains or the neck where it's just impossible for you know armies to get up there like sure they can fly a dragon there but what's one person on a dragon gonna do other than burn everything and then there's nothing for them to take over anyway and there's so. also like a parallel with the cranog cranog man men in the neck as well yeah it's oh, pretty true. similar yeah mm -hmm. basically the opposite of the riverlands which is for world war ii comparison purposes the poland of the seven kingdoms <laughs> <laughs> that's true so that's question to you guys so what do you think was in that letter to Aegon? Yeah. That's and, what and, I want to know. And for context, they, they're they talking about they've been in this war with Dorne. They're going to get a huge army and go back down and fight. Aegon gets a letter uh, from the, uh, the Queen of Dorne, opens it, reads it. There's blood on his hands when he finishes. He goes to Dragonstone for one day, comes back and says, nope, peace with Dorne. I mean, I imagine, it, 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 what is it, something of Rhaenys? That's all. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's I, it, like it has, it had it has to be. Because you loved your best. Mm -hmm. And before we go through ours, are there any uh, uh, favorite theories out there? Oh, that one. So, so one I saw that I thought was a, a neat, I, I, I think something involving Rainey's is, is most likely. Yeah. Um, just because there's talk of, yes, we know what happened to her dragon. We know she fell. We don't know if she was taken alive. We don't know how she died specifically. Um, but the letter was sent not too long after. So I, I think that's probably the most likely. But if, but if it's going to be a curveball theory, uh, because that's what we do when we, you know, don't have a new book out for a few do, months. Do you think, though, that um, he went to Dragonstone to contemplate or to check something? Uh, for me, it's check something. For, for the tinfoil, I think it's check something. I, I think a fun idea is that uh, basically Dorn said, said, yes, you can beat us, but um, you, your whole reign is based on dragons. You have three. Without them, you wouldn't have conquered all the kingdoms you have. One of them has already fallen to Dorne, and we know it, we will destroy your the the, uh, the source of your power, which is your dragon eggs. We've already destroyed one on Dragonstone. Oh. Go check. Oh. And the blood is in the letter. And he goes and he goes flies to Dragonstone, oh. sees that an egg is gone, and fly, comes back and says, "Yep, all right, let's figure out peace." I like that. Because, yeah, because at this oh. point, Dorne has already like embarrassed. That the Targaryen conquering for years, and if it goes on much longer, <laughs> he's going to start losing the morale of the Six Kingdoms he, he's already taken. Yeah. Yeah, there comes a point where you cut your losses and you just say, I guess this is a better outcome than I'm going to get under any other yeah. circumstances. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. We had a question in that case. Hi, uh, I had a question. If, you, if we do assume that uh, the speculation that uh, Avon received, like, I don't know, maybe one of Brain's uh, uh, body parts, which body part would, would the Martell have sent them that he would have recognized as actually, like, you know, radiant? And also, how did the blood not seep through the paper and the paper fall apart? I just, I have questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I, I thought, I maybe I read it wrong. I thought, it, like, his hand was his bleeding hand. because he was so, like, like rip, ripping, ripping himself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. I, I actually, I, I reread this on the plane over here. It, it, it says he reads the letter. And when he puts it down, there is his hand is dripping with blood. So it's it's, uns, it's written so it could go either way. Right. And now we're never gonna know. Maybe That's it was like a mean. finger wrapped in a cloth or something. Uh, maybe. <laughs> I'm thinking a year, but sure. And yeah, then there's the idea, like people said something about it could be some sort of black magic or something done to it, yada yada yada. Right, I think that's the, the small folk theory is yeah, that okay. he was ensorcelled by some spell in the letter. Ensorcelled. 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 That's a word. I thought possibly that oh. he had uh, been cut. He can't see his phone over here, so when you all are not in the microphones, oh. nobody will not hear you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming you can hear me. Yeah, I think I think Van and I have the best microphones. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I had, I had read it as he had uh, been cut, and I thought maybe he had been poisoned. Mm. And, and maybe there was an agent there with some sort of antidote, and he had to uh, bargain for peace for his life. 
Hmm. Interesting. I like that too. Yeah. Actually, big. I like the idea of, of poisoning him. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if this is biologically possible. If, it, if it's some kind of poison <laughs> that makes him infertile, that would be even better because there's a lot of theories that none of his heirs are actually his heirs. Well, I think that was, that was, at that point it was too, I mean, he was already, you know, he'd already, they'd already had the two kids that were totally his, right, y'all? <laughs> votes on, votes on whether or not, um, Magor and, and, uh, oh my God, Amy's, thank Amy's. you. I just Horrible hate, man. I hate his Amy's. name, I hate his name. Um, <laughs> votes on whether or not they were actually his children. Who, who thinks Magor and Amy's were actually Aegon the Conqueror's children? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> One person I mean, in the room. The family tree is already like this. Yeah, so. yeah, right. They have the Targaryen name. It's like an upside I don't, down pinecone. I don't know cone. if it's really in George's character to have a hidden bastard in these books. <laughs> 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 well, they're basically the Plantagenets, right? So everybody's everybody mm-hmm. else's cousin, and they all have an equal claim across like fifteen different people. So, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Which actually might be a good segue to the Greens and Blacks if we want to go there next. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so well, the greens and blacks, we, we had like such a good portion of their story already with, um, what was it? The, the prince, the, the rogue and the, pr- queen, and the rogue prince, prince and the queen and the rogue prince were both. So, so yeah. And there were definitely some changes made, um, between those texts and, uh, and fire and blood, but it was, you know, we got so much more like how many, gosh, how many pages, how much of a book of fire and blood was on the dance of dragons? Cause it was a lot. It was a good like seven, eight, nine chapters somewhere yeah. in that range. About this chunk? Yeah. yeah. Maybe a couple yeah. hundred pages. And, but that's what he's doing with this, right? This is George's sandbox to play in. This is where he has all these ideas. Like, I mean, look at uh, Jaehaerys and Alysanne's daughter, Daenerys, who died of the shivers. That was when that happened. Everyone was like, oh, Danny's going to die in the north this season. I'm calling it. Uh, but he's putting those in there because they're just little, like, workshopped ideas he can play around with and say, ah, uh, yes, this one character that happens to have this similarity or thing, this is fun. What if the story went this way? So, uh, it was, it was interesting seeing that with some of those characters and especially because these chapters were all prefaced with, like, the question of secession. I love that that was kind of the preface for all of this, like, for the Dance of the Dragons and going back to the last great council before that he would just put a chapter in there just to remind you all this happened to figure out why girls aren't allowed to rule (laughs) i don't know so uh greens or blacks guys what do you think blacks 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 are your traitor And, and so going to the books, I think this is one of the ones where when he first wrote it, I don't know if he wanted to make it as clear cut which side was the was the least bad side. Mm. Um, oh. like some of the things he changed were uh, Cast Rhaenyra in a more sympathetic light. Um, in yes. the books, I, I, I sorry, in Fire and Blood, I don't. It's hard to see a reading there in especially modern sensibilities where the Greens come out looking good. Um, their the, the, their whole dynasty is based on. All right, yes, all of these lords took vows that Rhaenyra would be queen, but also what if we didn't? <laughs> and, and, and she's over there having a baby, so she's distracted and her dad died. What if we just don't tell anyone for a while? And then the guy that speaks up is like, excuse me, I, Sir Beesbury, think we shouldn't do this. Oh, that's excellent. Um, are there any other honorable men here? No, kill him. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what drives me nuts about that one is how, how naive Alison Hightower is thinking that she could get out of this thing unscathed, that they can have a coup and have none of her kids be killed in this. Like, it's obvious to anybody that, you know, there's going to be a huge war breaking out. Well, I mean, I think, and honestly, this is she's she's a she's a highborn lady. She's had everything kind of like handed to her on a platter her entire life, and you know, so she they, they don't think like that. You know what I mean? And that's kind of without without that sort of lack of um, of just just general knowledge of how the world works. Most of the stuff in these books wouldn't happen. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, Rhaenyra would have had an easier victory if if she didn't have a little bit of the same naivete. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, was it blood and cheese? Mm-hmm. Oh. I'm sorry. You have access to most of your adversaries. Um, you have a secret passage into their castle where they're all sleeping. 
and you do this like game of like, all right, well, we're just gonna kill one of your small kids. Which kid is it going to be? Haha, we got the other one. It's like a big prank, and it's like, no, no, win the war. Yeah. <laughs> Get them all. Well, and that's the problem with Damon, and I think that was great for what they did put in of Damon to make sure you know what a jerky is. Uh, and that like, he, I mean, they start off and like, yeah, he had the gold cloaks wrapped around his finger. He had this, he had this. He's the darling, like, bad boy of the city. Uh, and she straight up is like, yeah, sure, go ahead, uncle husband. Uh, you should totally, <sighs> don't get me started. <laughs> How much time we got? Uh, like, go ahead, you do something to get back at them for vengeance for me. Okay, I trust you complicitly because you've always made great choices. What? Yeah, but don't trust him for sure. Why did you buy him? But it's also like w depends on which narrative you read because like if you read just the princess and the queen, he sounds mm -hmm. like a pretty good dude. And yep. But then you read the the rogue prince and it's like, wait, nope, I changed my mind. Go back oh. up. Oh yeah, the, the, the grooming was. Uh, oh, uh, that was gross. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know what? I, and I take it back. That's one where I don't know if Mushroom was completely honest <laughs> <laughs> uh, about the island. Um, but but uh, and actually, uh, so this goes to one of the changes when Rhaenyra at the end is uh, she goes to Dragonstone and she's betrayed by her garrison there. And she comes in and sees um, one of the Green's dragons severely injured in uh, The Princess and the Queen. She says some sardonic like quip. And when she's in these dire circumstances and her son is at the mercy of her enemies, she, she basically laughs at this dying dragon. And that doesn't always land right. And, and, and I thought it was funny because George like tempered that line so much um there's now a whole paragraph in fire and blood about whether or not she said that line because a lot of people there said she said something much more sympathetic like oh my gosh this is such a tragedy uh you know something way over the top in the dragon's favor and this is right before she dies it's her last words <laughs> and nobody can agree what she said um but in, in by this point in fire and blood you probably already made up your mind on whether you're green or black um, should be black. <laughs> oh, yeah, we've got, a, we've got a question back over here. Uh, yeah, I actually had a, a counterpoint to what we were talking about earlier. I think that Alice in Hightower thought, and I think she was probably correct, that if she didn't do something about it, Renita would have, would have probably gone after her sons. I don't think she was, I mean, yeah, she was going to start a war, but she had to try to fight, right? Renita didn't like her sons at all. Uh, and her being queen and having all the power, I don't think they would have really had a peaceful life after that. I, I tend to disagree that she didn't care for her kids. She did in a way, it's similar to Cersei. She's got a lot of those Cersei parallels that her kids were her extension of power. They're, uh, whether or not they're bastards, obviously, uh, we don't know. <laughs> and <laughs> There's a strong possibility. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, Allison, sorry, yeah. No, Allison didn't care, and it's because everyone from the Reach is scheming up John Denise just stay in their lane. Oh, that's, that's, some, that's like hardcore reach hate right there. That is some hardcore reach hate. I see you guys leaving. I know you're from the reach. <laughs> <laughs> they are though. The high towers are always scheming. Otto High Tower should have just sat there and ate his green beans. <laughs> they should have done what they did at the end. Just marry the kids together. Yes, yeah. and that's uh, we were just yelling about that the other day. That like on what whatever panel on Friday that like the real people that were like wrong were both parties. They should have just sucked up their pride, married your kids. You owe the small folk. It's a feudal contract. Like you don't just get to fly around on your dragons playing God all day when everybody's getting raised by fire on the ground. That's not that's not how feudalism works. But 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 it is. They, yeah, yes. I was gonna say yeah. Yeah. small small folk casualties are literally lines at the end of which lords died in a battle for them. Yeah. yeah. Um, their kids were all that really Matter. I do. I, I think the 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 Allison was was driven primarily by what's going to happen to my kids. I think mm -hmm. to a degree, Rhaenyra was too. And the the idea of marrying them together would it have been more plausible, more palpable, and acceptable to the two of them if there hadn't been a knife fight between yeah. six year olds um, <laughs> yeah. in the stables? Yeah. Well, and that's why like the storming of the dragon pit is so wild, right? Because the people finally do something about it. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's. Right, it's a little gross, but yeah, it's a little. Is that, that, they yeah, were all cray cray, but it, 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 <laughs> yeah, it was a small folk rise up moment. Yeah, that was some pitchfork scrap. It was great, and I, I, I mean, actually, and that happening just shows the fact that, like, if the small folk really did rally like that, that they could actually get something done. They might not win, but uh, but yeah. <laughs> um, I thought I saw someone over there with their hand up, but I guess I could be wrong. 
Any questions? No. Uh, one thing I did want to make sure we talked about, um, and I figured, I thought it would come up naturally, but I guess not. The four-headed beast. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, <laughs> with Alyssa Farman and... Uh, Way to go, George. You finally got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, but that that was like one of those little side stories that I had, you know, no idea that this was a thing that, that existed. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know if it was something George has had in mind for a while and I, I missed it in some other subtext or whatever. But it was really it was really great getting little stories like that. But I mean, the, the four headed beast one was definitely one of my favorites. Just like this pack of women who just tears shit up <laughs> you know and they're friends and they have fun and i know it doesn't end all that happily but again this is song of ice and fire so <laughs> yeah i love those side stories i think that was really exciting i liked uh I, I, we haven't really talked a lot about jaharis and allison because that could go on for 80 years uh but that was again a huge chunk of this book and that's my favorite part it was oh no so we'll good. get to yeah, that I yeah, know we will. yeah we will get to that that's gonna <laughs> probably close around because that's gonna take a while but uh it, the, the coolest thing was just like seeing some of those interactions like Alice Ann's ladies that she had at court um, seeing just some of the inner workings of day to day life for some of these royals that we don't really get to see in the current modern books oh, like I, I really like the repre representation like that's what I was making comment yeah, yeah. about yeah, because yeah. previously yes. whenever he's showing you know two women together it has not been mm -hmm. you know healthy yeah. Not I mean yeah well. we've got, we really had just gotten Danny and her slaves and yeah. Cersei. Uh, Cersei and um oh my gosh her name starts with a T right? Tyena Tyena thank you oh I always thought you were going to say Sansa <laughs> no. Oh God! Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. Not in a relationship sense, but just even in a Bechdel test sense, he doesn't have mm -hmm. a ton of strong scenes in the core books. No, no. Well, they were written in the '90s, yeah, to be honest. Aggressive. And I think he's probably he's gotten better. I think it gets yeah. better in the later books. But, um, but yeah, no. It was it was just great having this sort of side story. Again, sadly that it didn't end well. But uh, I mean, it was a, it was Alyssa Farman who took um, the eggs. Uh, that you know the theory obviously is that they're Danny's eggs. Someone was saying, was it on our heroic journey? I was someone. Someone was saying at some point, um, you know that oh they, but they can't be their eggs. Like how would they have gotten from Bravos to to Pentos? And it's like they're 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 uh, worth a whole ton of money. Like somebody oh, absolutely wouldn't could have traded them at some point. So it'd be an awfully big coincidence if they weren't too. It's just exactly. Other ones, yeah. So. I mean, no, no, no. Okay. you don't understand. These are a different three dragons. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I get the, 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 you know, desire that there are still other dragon eggs out there. And I, I mean, honestly, I do think there, prob there are, you know, um, mm -hmm. but they're going to be stone, basically, like, like they yeah. were. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's no more, there's no more Dannys, you know, no additional Dannys to, uh, you know, fire they pit can. them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, you know, they track all of the eggs that are mentioned and all of the clutches that are mentioned. And there are unconfirmed, is it a clutch or isn't, like when... Uh, uh, Silverwing and Allison went to visit mm -hmm. the north, and I think it's only Mushroom says something like, and there was a clutch of dragon eggs, uh, you know, left there at Winterfell, so there may be dragons, uh, you know, deep in Winterfell now. Um, there's no confirmation of that, and then, you know, in the in the Duncan Egg books, you have a random dragon egg show up at White Walls uh, to be the prize, and so, so there are mystery eggs out there, but for three to go missing, and then three to show up, and the person who presumably stole the three eggs to somehow be able to afford a fast Bravosi boat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, uh oh, well, she probably did. Yeah. Um, I did want to mention that I know George did say in an interview last year that mm -hmm. we would be finding out where Danny got, or like the origin of Danny's eggs. So, more likely than not, yes, mm -hmm. the ones that Alyssa stole were for Danny. We have a question. Yes. yes. Okay, so speaking of the dragon's eggs, big huge shout out to Cannibal because that's my favorite dragon mm -hmm. and one of these days I want him and Drogon to meet because uh, he's still out there but uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to talk one of the things I found fascinating about the book was the whole all the dragon world was just the, the practices of them having the dragon eggs these weren't simply just dragon eggs that were just simply sitting there as you know just like props these are dragon eggs that actually hatched they had trainers of varying degrees of varying ages you know, they had dragons that did get along with some of the Targaryens, and then they had dragons that would actually kick off some of the uh, Targaryens and wouldn't actually necessarily bond with them. So I was really, I was really fascinated by that, just that richness of history and learning about, you know, the whole practice of 
you know, raising dragons, you know, how dragons interacted with the Targaryens and then with Valerians when they found out that, you know, one of the Valerians, the bastards, could actually bond with uh, the dragons, but yet they had dragons that you had these, right, you know, blood true Targaryens and they would say, nope, get off me and throw them off and uh, 100 feet off the ground. So I wanted to kind of just kind of get your, what your, your just kind of <coughs> thoughts on that whole, you know, that whole history of raising the dragons and the practice of having the dragon eggs in the in the cribs with the Targaryens, raising them, their projections, you know, etc. Yeah. So on. uh, one thing I found really interesting was not all the Targaryens had the eggs in the cribs. Like some of them, they would put the eggs in, and then some of them they would wait until they come of age, and then they're like, okay, go claim a dragon. And I thought that was. Very interesting. Like, I, I was there a reason behind that? Is it like giving your kid a car and like the siblings don't get a car? You know what I mean? Like, no, you have to share with your older sister. I thought the most interesting thing about the dragons in, the, in terms of the kids was how George used that to reveal more about the character of the people. Yes. In other words, the, the dragon they thing. choose says a lot about them. Oh, I, I love that, and actually, Magor is a cr uh, prime example. As, as all these other kids are claiming their dragons, and, and the people are, even as he's winning tournaments and, and embarrassing um, squires twice his age in in the melees, he has a claim to dragon. And people are starting to joke that he's scared of claiming one, and he responds by saying, "There's only one dragon worthy of me," and he waits until uh, Balerion the Black Dread is available, yeah. and, then well, he, and then he takes his first car. <laughs> well, I mean, and I also, I also think that there might be some, and this is just kind of like a little pet theory of mine. Um, there, there might be some something behind the idea that some of the children that don't end up being able to ride dragons, like it's because of who they are, not their blood, but like it's like dogs can tell when a person doesn't like dogs, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, we have a question. Yep. Yeah, okay. I've got, okay. got a, a few. Yes. No, no, he's got it at first. There's one over here first, and then there's one on the opposite Okay. There are a bunch of questions out there. Okay. Um, I did just want to bring up real quick, uh, I really enjoyed, like, the psychology behind people being raised with their, or, like, having the egg in the crib, like you brought up, um, in the psychology of, like, will my egg hatch? What can I do better to make my egg hatch? Am I, it, it, um, what was it? Uh, oh, gosh, I can't remember. There's too many. Targaryens with the same names. Um, there's a set of twins. Well, there's a set of twins. One twin, their egg hatched, and the other one didn't. And she was very upset, and she's like, what did I do wrong with my egg that it wouldn't hatch for me? Am I not worthy of having a dragon? There's, there's a... There's a um there's a YouTuber who I'm not the biggest fan of, but uh, he has a video um, on, like, Targaryen, like, DNA, and this whole theory about... Uh, whether or not you had a mother or something has something to do with like your egg hatching, like whether or not your mother was like present in your life. Uh, and that's, it's like the only time I've ever, his name's Preston Jacobs. And it's, it's the only video of his like I've ever like cared about. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a really, really like crazy theory, but it's, it's definitely fun to watch, especially if you have like an interest in like DNA and biology. Um, we have a question over here. Um, while we're on the topic of hatching dragons, I was wondering how likely you guys think it if Summer Hall gets included in Fire and Blood 2. Yeah. Um, like what happened there, it got glossed over in World of Ice and Fire. Seems like it's probably a pretty big plot point, um, but clearly not enough to get included in the show, but you know, I'm just kind of wondering your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that like a big reason we haven't heard things is because it's going to be a spoiler for the books. So I don't think we're going to get part two of Fire and Blood until the books are done. Right. And, and yeah. the, the, I, until we get it in a Dunkin' Egg, I, I, I think George wants it to be in a Dunkin' Egg. So if for whatever reason Fire and Blood 2 came out first, I think we'd get just, you know, aspersions and some say, and we're not going to get a lot of info. But I, I believe at a recent convention, George even gave a, a general idea of the the publication order for the upcoming books, yes, and he, he specified, I'm going to do uh, this Dunkin' Egg and this Dunkin' Egg before Fire and Blood 2 comes out. So I think in his mind, uh, it's at least building to it. It's at least building to it. And I, I mean, to be fair, I, I, the details are really what we're going to see, and it's going to be sad, and you know, the whole nine yards, and that's going to be a good experience, but we kind of know-ish what happened, right? Like we know, blah, 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 prophecy, likely for eggs, things blowing up. 
I'm just saying, like, the general idea is there that it was, like, big, huge blood sacrifice to bring dragons yeah. back, yeah. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, I was curious if you had any theories about the uh, the Targaryen Princess area. I think her name was. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kind of the involuntary ride on Valerian to Valyria, and she got the weird fire parasites. So, what do you think was going on with all that? And for those who can't remember, this is the picture in the book that made you go, "Oh my god!" <laughs> <laughs> it's the it's the little story in the book that reminds you that George Martin was first and foremost a horror writer. Yeah. <laughs> horror area. Honestly, uh, just the thought of what she went through and the uh the description that the maester gives about her last what is it like eight hours or not yeah. even eight hours yeah. of life and she's just boiling from the inside it might have given me some really bad nightmares that night i'm not gonna <laughs> lie it was absolutely horrifying but now i'm really curious like what else is lurking in old valeria because valeria valerian was hurt too like what yeah. what can hurt yeah, what can what hurt, can hurt, a, what, the what can hurt a dragon, especially there, that one? There, there are at least two nightmares here that we don't really have the answers for. There's the fireworms inside her, and I say fireworms because that's the closest thing yeah. that's described yes. that it might be, but I don't think the fireworms were described as having human-like fingers and face, like, whatever they were described as, it, it could be fireworms, it could be something else, but then there's whatever was able to hurt Valerian, uh, who at this point has... He's the only survivor of old Valyria. That's how he knew to go back there. And he is enormous. He's supposed to have skin so hard at this point that even a uh, Euron Greyjoy, Alyssa, isn't going to be able to do anything. <laughs> uh, and, but there's something in old Valyria that's able to wound him so bad he goes, nope, okay, hold on, going back to these other humans. So I have two thoughts on that. The first thought is, anyone think about Victorian Greyjoy with those fireworms in the arm at all? Oh. Yeah. Just interesting. Yeah. Just a thought. You guys can ponder it. Talk about it at dinner. I don't know. Uh, that's what I thought of big time when I read that. I was like, oh, interesting. Didn't we just have someone else with worms in their arm? Um, but they had to get magic out of them thanks to Marwyn slash uh, Rick and Morty, whatever. Same guy, Marwyn the Mage. Uh, it's the same character. He's just like, what? <laughs> Sam, let me tell you about some magic. Uh, and then the second thought is I at, at the end of the show with Daenerys and the very last episode, what happened, that gave me very much so Arya Targaryen vibes as well. And I, in my mind, I imagine maybe she was being taken to Valyria with the original Valyrian the Dread, but Drogon. I mean, same color. Yeah, same things, exactly. Yeah. Like, we got it, he's big, he's mean. We got it, George. <laughs> Valyrian come again. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, hi. Mine was for Xerxes the first, who was king for not even one year, his nephew was Aegon the Unworthy. His dragon egg never hatched, and you mentioned that earlier. Sometimes their eggs never hatched. His never did, but he was a very capable, very worthy hand. And not a very good king, because he was one for a very short period before poison, I'm saying this in quotations, <laughs> They, they never said it, but they never didn't. <laughs> Aegon might like, come out. You never know, because Martin goes like, eh, he did, he did, and it's like, mm. <laughs> I'm asking about him, because he's one of the Targaryens when you said they, maybe they're not worthy, maybe they are. He was, well, okay, he was a damn good accountant. <laughs> I'm saying, was he not worthy as a Targaryen for that? Because I honestly, I don't know. So maybe an accountant really wronged George at one point. Uh, <laughs> given the fate of the first master of coin, that might be likely. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, I'm going to be small honest. Folk xenophobia I, got real bad there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to ask you, who was the first master of coin? Because I have no idea. I don't remember his name, but wasn't he one of the? He was the richest merchant in oh, Pentos, yeah. and they yes. brought him over to uh, finance the Red Keep and the yeah. rebuilding. That and, was a good. And job then there. everything went to crap. Uh, his nickname was the Lord of Air. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. yeah. a merchant, and not really. He was murdered, right? He murdered. Yeah. Oh, terribly yeah. by the small folk because he was foreign yeah. and yeah. Uh, yeah. obviously because robbing the treasury. Yeah, and he had left in the streets. <laughs> it's the full blown chaos neutral. He had his own interests at heart, not anyone else's. Right. But yeah, I mean, like, honestly, 
it's it's all going to be theories at this point as to why some you know some of the Targaryens get dragons and some don't. Um, but I mean, him him not being a bad person or him being a good accountant doesn't necessarily make him a dragon rider. Like, and just just you know what I mean. Like any more than than you know the Targaryen blood doesn't. There there were there were bastards in the Dance of Dragons that had less Targaryen blood in them. I'm you know that that rode I dragons. Don't, I don't know. I'm more of a Greyjoy person, so <laughs> I know, you know. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Like I don't even remember that king. So <laughs> it, it maybe it's, they barely touch on his reign. Actually, is gonna be in fire and blood going too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So maybe I mean maybe it, maybe it gets down to the point where like George is like I he's just a placeholder for a year. I am not really interested in trying to flesh out his character with a dragon. He, he I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was a placeholder, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Maybe at nine, tenth month reigned at the most, but he he's written in the annals, but. I mean, and there's a lot of there's a lot of those like written in the annals characters who are who are so brief, you know, because I mean George, his world is just so gigantic that we can't, you know, even he can't fit it all in there, no, you know, in, in the text that he has time to give us. And we have we the same trouble not. here. It, it is four forty five, so we want to move to Jeff yes, Harris. yes, yes. Question. After, after this question. question. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Okay, mine sort of segues into that a little bit. So um, this happened during your time. You know, in season seven, we saw Danny come rescue John and everybody from the north um, <laughs> above the wall because they were getting the white. Well, when Alisane goes to the wall, she talks about flying up to the wall with silver wings, her dragon, I think. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. And she says that her dragon will not go over the wall. She Redux. kept trying and trying, mm-hmm. and it wouldn't happen, and she couldn't figure out why. Mm-hmm. Well, the wall has its <laughs> has its own, you know, magic. Yeah, um, and it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious if she'll actually be able to fly past the wall or have that opportunity, or if by that point, I, I think timing wise in the books, the wall will be down by then. So by the time Dan even goes north, I mean, by the end of The Winds of Winter, she's what, going to land on Dragonstone? Likely. She has a lot to do in the East right now. Um, so hope, I think the wall will probably be down by the time she goes to it. That's my guess. And, and if you need a show, an, an internal show um, explanation, uh, Bran is marked by the Night King. Mm. and goes south of the wall, potentially destroying its magic protections that would have kept the dragons from yeah. going north and the That's others true. from going south. That's true. So. Well, and, and um, that that actually brings us to Jaehaerys and Alzan, which is how we're going to wrap up the last like 15 minutes of this panel. So um, do we have, before, before we jump into them, though, do, was there a question over there? I just want to make sure we got everybody. Okay, so okay. Jaehaerys and Alzan, y'all, take it away. Any questions about Jaehaerys and Alzan? Um, See one in the back. Yeah. And one in, also in the back. Oh, oh yeah, Mike's not on. No, it's on. It's, it's, it's on. It's, it's, it cuts in and out. Oh, okay. My apologies. All right, if, if, if you go ahead and say it, I'll, I'll repeat it into the mic. I can project. Yeah. Um, I feel like it was just a really good time for it to come up. Um, story-wise, exceptionalism. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like it was important for the main storyline. You know, we've got Fagon got Daenerys coming back, you know, you know, you're talking about bastards, you're talking about people with illegitimate claims, the church is going to obviously have something to say, you know, the, the exceptionalism idea, you know, that I mean, Daenerys is the child of siblings, um, is that going to come up, is that why George fleshed it out here, are we testing the waters with what people think about exceptionalism, the peasants, the lords and ladies in general, is that, is that why it's there? Yeah. And so the, the, the question was regarding Targaryen exceptionalism um, and whether George took the opportunity with Jaehaerys and Alysanne to flesh it out and explain it a little more um, because of how it may resonate in the upcoming books uh, with both Daenerys and um, the purported Aegon the Sixth or Fagan. And um, as far as bastards, as far as Trueborn, if, they're, if they have Targaryen blood uh, and how the exceptionalism uh, would apply in there. Is that generally right? Well, I mean, and, and you know, the, the, the Jaehaerys and Allison story started with, you know, they they weren't supposed to get married. You know what I mean? They they went and got married of their own accord. They originally weren't supposed to. Um, so it, it, it kind of, like, it kept that as a, as a tradition. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it is interesting. I was surprised they even mentioned it in season eight. It was one of those things that I thought was just not going to get talked about with the whole like very being like well this p- people won't like them getting married if they're related it won't work so i was very surprised that even got brought up 
but with this happening, it makes me think of like, I mean, think about Aegon, if he really is Aegon, which he totally is, um, and not a Blackfire. He, not at all. Not, not at all. Else. I don't know why you say that. Um, but if he is, you know, Aegon, he's the son of Rhaegar and Elia, which, you know, m if we're trying to go towards a maybe more progressive future for Targaryen rule, we might not want, like, pure incest. Maybe we can start to kind of throw something in the pot there, you know? <laughs> Stir it up. Uh, so, I mean, and he has a better claim, obviously, no matter what in the world's eyes. He has everything. He has Blackfire. He has... Uh, he'll likely have the crown. He'll have it all. So yeah, yeah. He he's has a penis man. also. Um, <laughs> like that's he has it all, and that parentage is also something that I think will be looked at because you look back at the Targaryen reign, and we don't see a lot of successful rulers like Jaehaerys and Alysanne. They had a pretty successful time. Um, Viserys won. He had a good time because they set it up for him, and he just coasted until he died, and then the whole world went to crap. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't see a lot, though. You don't just in your mind go, oh, they were amazing rulers about the Targaryens, and people don't forget that currently. So it's going to be a rough ride, especially with all that incest going on. The, the Targaryens' magic power is to have all these incestuous children born and not have any kind of mutations and deformities and things. That's, That's a true. Yeah. Impressive power. I mean, they're, they're, they have a high immunity or resilience to disease, yeah. so you wonder if there's yeah. something... And, and the other thing, that you know, their connection with dragons is something magic, but it's something uh, magic genetically. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we, the, something's wonky. Yeah. With, they may have a triple helix DNA. We have no idea. <laughs> um, but, yeah. but exceptionalism also... It, it, we, we touched on the show and, and John and Daenerys... I think the show had a real miss there, or, or they just didn't have time to address it in a, in a sufficient way when they said, oh, the North is never going to accept the two of you marrying if you're aunt and nephew, um, oh, because that would tie it all up into a neat bow, and I'm thinking, it, weren't Ned's parents cousins? They were. They were cousins, yeah. and then there's like John L. Snow. Yeah. John L. Snow married Sansa one Stark, and or John L. Stark, and they were uh, niece and uncle. Right. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure... But okay. Um, you know, Targaryen exceptionalism is right, right, right. We just want brother sister also. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and uh, yeah. Oh they, yeah. They were cousins. Yeah. Yeah. First cousins, it's, second cousins. It's very right, specific. Second cousins? specific yeah. The incest. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Eleanor was descended from Teddy, not from the Franklin side. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, the thing that struck me though about the the exceptionalism rule and all that, okay, is that it was it was used to justify one king and queen being king and queen, whereas others before them in the exact same circumstance, oh, that's unacceptable, period, can't do it. And yet, if it's the right king and queen, oh, we can find a, a loophole. Mm -hmm. And that's so straight out of English history, it kept, kept making me think about how uh, when, when Henry IV, Bolingbroke, overthrew Richard II, it's like, oh, he's the usurper. He's the usurper. Ah, he shouldn't be king. He shouldn't be king. He has his son, Henry V, the greatest hero in English history. Oh, no problem with him being king. But then when Henry VI is born and he's kind of oh, weak, no. oh, we got to get back to the Yorks again, man. It's like, if you are a successful king, we can find a rule to make it okay. And, and success oh, yeah. is one ingredient, and the threat of the church losing power is another. Yes. Yeah. Because Hen on Henry VIII vibes. Oh, hell. Uh, mm -hmm. The church, yes, the church is going to maybe not condone ancestry, but if your dragons are powerful enough and your rule is powerful enough and Old Town may not make it, mm -hmm. that, that, that's another element of them right. their bread and saying, okay, well, how about you come get anointed here and have us be part of your power structure? Yep. And as long as we can do this, maybe we can just kind of turn a blind eye to this. Mm -hmm. one, one thing I did want to bring up was, um, with the exceptionalism, uh, with the when the first Targaryen died of a disease that they weren't supposed to have, and the uh, the ripple effect that it brought to the kingdoms, because they're like, oh well, I mean, the only reason they're able to be like this is because they're Valyrian and they're supposed to be higher than us and they're supposed to be better than us and they're not supposed to get That's right. what we have. And I really enjoyed seeing the reaction to that first Targaryen getting sick from a quote unquote normal disease. It's like Superman's bleeding and everybody's like, oh, what about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the gods are bleeding. And it, what's interesting about that is Jaehaerys and Alysan actually kind of started to do it right, right? Like, they started marrying people off their kids, like, to different people. Mm -hmm. uh, they started marrying, like, Daea. She got, was married off to House Aaron, and they started to kind of, you know, okay, you marry here, you marry here. A couple of you can marry yeah, each other. That's fine. the ones in the line for the throne. Right, yeah. yeah. 
True. But they still at least tried to sell some of them off that way, you know? Like, it's not pure, <laughs> just 100% tarred. Yeah, yeah, yeah they true. just they just want the ones who are going to be sitting on that throne to be yeah. uh, just complete products of their yeah. incest. These two and these two, you guys are good. You can get married. The rest of you, it's, it's another house. <laughs> I don't even want to see what Christmas. <laughs> Because they had like 13. They just walked out after the six. That's what my grandma said. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for probably one more question. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, mine is actually... No, no, no. It's not bad at all. It's like... <coughs> Zahari's... Oh, Alice Sane and... They had the most normal, stable relationship mm-hmm. with the Targaryens. For the most part. Ish. Mine is stands off. Toward the end, it got rocky. But, well, yeah. yes it did, but... What relationship has not? <laughs> they had the most stable, most... They did talk about it ever. I'm asking a really get your calculators out question. How many years were they married? Oh, gosh. Oh, God. Math is hard. I, I did not know that there would be math on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an English right. major. Said, math isn't for me. Saying, so I'm I mean, I mean they, they, they... They married before the age of majority. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think they were 13. Yeah, 14. Well, it depends on which marriage. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The real one. Ones to each other, so. And what, yeah, well, they, they, had like a, they, they had, like, a secret wedding, yeah. so. Which, like also, said, that part was super badass for Pate the Woodcock, just being like, oh, well, if somebody's going to die here first, it is going to be you, Lord Baratheon, before I let you come towards my king and queen. Hey, Baratheon! And, 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 <laughs> and the segue that question, when do you think the relationships, uh, the marriage started to die? Uh, sexism? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's very early. I mean, that's the problem. Yeah, the, it's like, wait, why can't my granddaughter be in line? Yep. Yeah. That's yeah. Well, it started with started, her, but one. it started with her first daughter because her first daughter was You're the right. first one. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, again, like you said, it, they were a very stable relationship, but, but, but uh, I mean, I'd be pretty angry if I was Allison and my daughter was being passed over, How too. How they married? I have no idea. No clue. Oh, well, it was, I mean, it was their whole, it was their whole lives. Opened, so. What have we got? 49 AC, and he died in 103, so that. She 50s. died first. I think it was, she like, 57 or something, first. something she like that. Die she, no, she did die I first. think it might have been. It was about 50. 50-ish. 50-ish. She had it's a long time. After she all right, so last thoughts, guys. We are Real all quick. wrapping up. Yeah, last thoughts. Anything? Anything? Um, Brian, Chloe, you guys um, have I just want to take one second and give a shout out to the fingers who are three <laughs> tiny, not significant islands between, uh, you know, around the veil. Why is this and happening? as the Targaryens are conquering the entire continent, um, the fingers say, no, you know what? We, we are not going to stay with the veil. We're not going to be conquered by the Targaryens. We are our own kingdom. And here is yeah. Queen Sunderland, and even after the Vale was conquered, every king was conquered except Dorne, um, they kept that going. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the ballsiest 500 men in the <laughs> Them and their webbed toes. They, are. <laughs> they love their webbed toes. Um, All right. Well, that uh, about does it for this particular panel, but Looney Theories is tonight at 10 o'clock. Oh, no. Come along, bring Sorry, your drinks. Sisters, Ooh. Oh. Come along, bring your drinks. Uh, you, you will have to get in line early. Again, do not uh, forget to rate us on the app and ask for a bitter, bigger room and maybe some better uh, microphones. That'd be great. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to Tara Lynn's A Geek Saga podcast. If you like what you heard, please check out my website, ageeksaga.com, or consider supporting me on Patreon at patreon.com backslash ageeksaga.